Hello, scholars. Uh, honors class. I've got you reading some material um, which is about medieval thinking. And uh, we're going to go into St. Francis of Assisi and Bonaventure, uh, which is more, you know, late 1100s into the 1200s. And uh, this is what we're talking about now is the birth of Europe, which is several hundred years before this. We're going to talk about 600 and 800. And in the birth of Europe, what we mean is that for us, you know, these concepts are huge and can mean so many things. Uh, for us, it's about a unifying, a, a cultural identity being formed. It's a Christian cultural identity. It ties in with the Germanic, goes back into the classical, very much biblical, and going back through the Bible into the Jews. You know, kingship will return because of an idea of David and Melchizedek, you know, and stuff like that. But, but it's complex, it pulls together to say, but at its center is going to be an educational structure, a, a really built around what we now call the humanities, a, a mentality of how to approach the world, how to approach nature, how to approach politics, how to approach our, our, uh, our way of understanding who we are, and especially how humans flourish. And these are going to be, it, it, it's, this is a world which is more modern to us. It's, a moder it's modern because we understand it if we come out of a Christian community, because we understand these ideas of authority and submission that we've already read in, in uh, Augustine, and we've seen uh, in Boethius, and, and, uh, and this is this, you know, a world in which the individual finds our flourishing in God, in the Creator, in, 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 in uh, obey, obeying, okay? And so, uh, in our modern, modern world, <laughs> we, we struggle with this a lot, but we have to go through this, that classical world, and then we move into this, you know, and everything's falling apart in Augustine and Boethius, and then it starts to come together with these two guys, Gregory and Charlemagne. Okay, Gregory and Charles. And uh, you can see something new going on already, you know, because the, there's these new names. These are very Western civilization names, Gregory and Charles, you know. Uh, well, this is, this, is, uh, um, this is who we are and who we are becoming uh, is what we're talking about today. But it especially has to find some unity. And the, uni the great, greatest unifiers... Uh, advocates of unity are these two guys here, Gregory and Charlemagne. So let's let's talk about Gregory first. Gregory lives around 600. As with Boethius, Boethius and Cassiodorus, he comes from an ancient Roman family. And as an ancient Roman family, he has authority by just the those old Roman ideals of ancient families, you know. But then he also has authority because of piety. His... Uh, 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 I don't know why I have the hills of Rome on there. I was thinking this one was, yes, there it is. Okay. His um, mother and his aunt, very pious women, uh, had raised him in this piety. And so they had created what was like a little monastery up there, a little prayer place on the, on the top of this hill, which is now called San Gregorio. This is all Renaissance buildings now. But they had a palace up there of which uh, most of it was probably still in ruins or something like that and but they're living in a corner of an old ancient palace uh, doing devotions reading their bibles uh, uh, dedicated to prayer and uh, gonna Gregory is gonna live that life out but on the other hand is as he uh, gets called to become the bishop and bishops have duties Augustine had duties. Remember the distinction we created between Benedict and Augustine, or Benedict and, and uh, Boethius and Cassiodorus. Benedict had this idea of creating a, a, a first as an anchorite, as a hermit, and then and then a group, a, a, a eating group, a, you know, a dinner a dinner group actually, a Cenobic monasticism in which they would pray together and live together and eat together. And, and devote their life to Christ as the world is all falling apart. 
Well, you know, Gregory believed in this. Gregory up here uh, was living this kind of life, and then he writes, he writes the life of Benedict. And this is Monte Cassino, the place well, you know, as it grew huger and huger, as uh, the place that um, where Benedictine monasticism has its mother house. But, you know, uh, uh, Gregory held up Benedict as a great model. And so that's part of Gregory's role in, uh, in, in unifying Europe is to promote this Benedictine monasticism, which will flourish and then break into different forms but have a very important role uh, as spiritual leaders, okay? And also later on as cultural entities, libraries and things like that. But you see, Benedict was a monk, you know, and Gregory wanted to be one, but couldn't be one because he was called. Vox Populi, the old, an old system of, you know, crowds of people gathering when the Pope, when the Bishop of Rome died and, and everybody yelling out names, and gradually, oh yeah, Gregory's a guy. So uh, gradually, everybody is yelling out Gregory. And in this, this is the election then, and Gregory feels called by the Holy Spirit because of the Vox Populi. You see, the Holy Spirit speaks through the voice of the people. This is very similar to the stuff that I talked about in, a, in my article on educating bees. Consensus. Consensus has authority. Popular sovereignty, consensus, vox populi. These have authority, and they have authority in the way that honey, you know, the hive produces honey, and that honey is something magic, something Holy Spirit in this, is that the vox populi, the gathering of these voices, has been the voice of the Holy Spirit. So Gregory becomes what we call Pope, it's the, uh, and, but Pope was a term used by a number of situations. It means Papa, it means Father, but uh, he actually gave himself, uh, a, you know, a title, Servus Savorum Dei, the servant of the servants of God. Uh, he perceived bureaucracy as an upside down pyramid. You know, everyone else is about, he's serving everyone. And so uh, that's the job of a bishop. Now, you get elected Bishop of Rome. Uh, Rome is falling apart. It's in ruins still. Uh, there's really no political forces of, uh, to sort of negotiate with. You're the, you are the guy who's in charge of like fixing the roads and making the sewers run and, and making sure things are happening correctly uh, in the town. And so Gregory takes on and asks, asks himself this great question, which is the great question all administrators should ask is, is basically, what is my job? And Gregory believes that it's to confirm, coordinate, integrate, missionize, expand, to sort of support the whole of Christianity. Okay? He is supposed to make it work. It's a pragmatic, practical thing. Make it work. Make it do what it's supposed to do on earth. Okay? You know, he's the, he's the on-site guy for God. All right? I, I, I want to point out to you, uh, the uh, Gregorite, where Gregory comes from, is actually biblical. Uh, it's where um, Jesus tells the disciples to wake up, be alert. Okay, that's Gregorite. It's a command. Wake up, be alert. And so Gregory takes on this name, you know, and uh, I'm not sure he changes his name or whether that's his given name. That's an interesting question. Popes will later change their names or, or people have baptismal names or something that are different from their birth names. But I'm not sure where Gregory got this. But, but it was, it's a biblical name, Gregory. But it's a Western Civ name. It's, a, it's not a name popular before. And it's a name that comes later and becomes, you know, we all know a Gregory. Okay, so he's, what's my job to do this? And then he embraces uh, Augustinian ideas of uh, basically a lowered expectation. This is earthly. The church can't be a utopia. The state can't be a utopia. We're just going to try and do the best we can. Okay, and so a lot of Augustinian values. And one of the most important of these 
Augustinian values that comes down is the, the sermon, the job of the priest, the job of the bishop, to give sermons and to be the pastor. And so he writes, he writes a book on being a pastor and encouraging people to have this. The priest is not supposed to be some lord over everyone. The priest is not supposed to be some sort of elite. The priest is supposed to be a pastor, a, a, a shepherd to the flock, a, a good shepherd, okay, working with the people. And so a lot of really nice things come out of Gregory. Uh, you know him also for Gregorian chant. Um, it's not clear that he invented Gregorian chant or even um, <laughs> wrote these songs or anything, but it, it, it was in his spirit. It was in the Gre Gregorian spirit of unifying worship. Let's sing together. Let's all sing the same songs. Let's all sing in Latin. Let's sing the Psalms in Latin together in ways that uh, unify us. You see, this is, this is just good, solid wisdom, practical wisdom. We do this in churches all the time. The church that sings together is the church that can work together. So <laughs> um, we start to get this unifying idea that way. Uh, Gregory is just looking at lots of different ways to promote. He promotes, reads his Bible, and, and Jesus says, you know, the job of the church is to go out into all the world, the Great Commission. Well, Gregory looks around and says, well, that's, that hasn't been happening too well. And, uh, and so Gregory actually writes a letter. Gregory, is, there's a sort of controversy about this, but it's very clear in some of the newest biographies of Gregory. Gregory does not claim universal rule over the church. As bishop of Rome, he's bishop of Rome, but he also takes on a, um, because of a, Rome's tradition, he takes on a role of like, okay, I'm, I'm supposed to help coordinate other bishops. I'm supposed to help other people do things. So I'm, I'm bigger than just Rome. So this is that urge to be Roman and Catholic. But Catholic means universal. And he does not consider himself the ruler of the African church or the ruler of the Eastern, what becomes the Eastern Orthodox church, nor does he see himself the ruler of these there's, there's actually lots and lots of churches that are called Syrian, you know, out in Iraq and Iran and on out into the, the Silk Road and stuff. Uh, they're going this way. In fact, there's, there, are, there are popes in Baghdad which are as, you know, powerful or more powerful than, than Gregory. So Gregory does not claim global control of Christianity. Uh, he does, though, think that and he writes this letter. He writes a letter to these bishops in Constantinople and Alexandria and, and Antioch and saying, okay, Antioch, you're sort of in charge of missionizing that way. Constantinople, you're obviously got that as your jurisdiction. Africa, you belong to them. Me, what's my job? Always asking what my job is. My job is to look at this story, this frontier. You know, what's up there with these Germanic tribes and all that sort of stuff, these Goths and people. What's up there? And so I am going to send missionaries that way. And so this becomes the foundation of what we call papal jurisdiction. Uh, he is not claiming an absolute jurisdiction. There are already Christian churches up there, but Benedictine monasticism is going to spread that way, and it's going to be honoring and cherishing the leadership and wisdom of the Bishop of Rome, especially Gregory and Gregory's memory. Um, missionaries are going to go up here and found new churches. And these new churches eventually will become, people will become bishops. Okay, this happens, the, Can the church in Canterbury up here. In a little, you know, that, that's founded as a mission church by Gregory. And then eventually the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, who is the head church officer of all uh, Great Britain, is his historical legacy is that he, he comes from, from uh, Gregory sending him up there. And so what you have is there's an idea of jurisdiction. And so with an idea of jurisdiction, letters are passing forth. You know, we're, we're starting to unify this as an identity and a culture. And so they, people ask Rome what... What should we do? What, what should be marriage practices? What should be? What should you do with old temples? 
what, when we encounter pagans and convert them, what, how do we handle this and that, you know? And, uh, and Gregory would give his wisdom. And then later popes would too, because the tradition seems to go. But this is the roots of an integrated Roman Catholic church in Europe that is the cultural driving entity, okay? Uh, education, music, literature, the liberal arts, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of stuff. Well, the language, Latin, um, the spirit of that we're all in this together, uh, working toward the, the will for the will of God, politically and socially and culturally is 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 wrapped up in in what Gregory sort of started and and did with him, his own sort of vision as a bishop. Okay, my job is a bishop. I'm not a monk. I can't just pray all day. I have to be you know, getting my hands dirty in this world that's actually f r fairly messy. So Gregory's a great guy. Uh, you know, you, can, you can't do wrong by reading biographies of Gregory or reading his, his pastor, his stuff about being a pastor, reading his biography of Benedict. Uh, Gregory's a very interesting guy. Now, let's talk about this guy. This is Charlemagne, Charles, Charles the Big, Charles the Great. He's a big guy. Uh, we know a lot about him because we do have books about him. There's two lives of Charlemagne, Einhardt, and, and uh, these, uh, these guys. Uh, oh, and, and by the way, like, <laughs> Notker the Stammerer, you know, this is how you often get a last name. He's Charles the Big. His uh, grandson is going to be Charles the Bald. Uh, there's Louis the Fat. <laughs> you know, there's all sorts of, you know, descriptors become second names. And you guys know these. You know, someone's last name will be Taylor. Someone's last name will be Little. Someone's last name will be, you know, uh, all sorts of things. And these are, these are these old names. These are European names, you know. And this is that European identity that spreads down to us is coming this way, okay? So this is Charles the Big. He lives around 800. Fascinating story how he gets to be king and stuff like that. Um, the main point is, is that his father, Pepin the Short, uh, Pepin, Pepin wanted to consolidate himself and his power as king. He actually wanted to remove another king and put himself in. And uh, how do you do this non-violently? It's a great question. These are, these are, these are great questions of, of, uh, that changed the course of history is I want, I want to do this non-violently. I don't want to just kill off the king's family and take over the palace, the palace coup. So who do I go to? Who has jurisdiction? Who, has, who, who does everybody in Europe look to? Well, they look to the Pope. And so he writes a letter to the Pope, and the Pope confirms that he should probably be the king. Okay? And then so there's a... Uh, a, a, a it's an easy transition. The other, and they're not killed off. Other other people are put into monasteries and stuff like this. But the the Carolingian family, Pepin the Short, becomes king, and then his son Charlemagne takes over. And he's incredibly dynamic, and he's a big thinker and a big thinker in the ways of his father. He wants to work with that pope in Italy. Uh, I want to I want to attach myself to his to the the church's identity. And so what happens is that you get a church-state alliance, which is working in an Augustinian fashion. We're not creating perfect societies or anything like that. We're not utopian, but we have an alliance and we work together. Uh, these, this biography by Einard will, will actually give uh, a story of Charlemagne presenting him as Augustus. You know, they actually models him as a Caesar Augustus. He is a Caesar Augustus, but he's also, more particularly, a Constantine. Constantine was the one who worked closely with bishops. And so with this, uh, he wants to work closely with bishops, especially to facilitate a unified culture, a unified political system. Uh, and he has a go-to bishop, and that go-to bishop first is a monk named... Alcuin, and he brings him down. He imports him from up in up in you know York in England. Brings him down into into what is now France and Belgium, and 
and places him in the palace, eventually makes him a bishop, but he is supposed to lead, lead the empire in uh, education, uh, in a lot of issues of, of, of how to make us all one. And, and uh, in, the, in these biographies of Charlemagne, Charlemagne himself and his daughters, he looks after his daughters and stuff, want to get educated. And so Charlemagne, as the emperor, will go to school and learn his letters and learn how to speak Latin and, and do things like that. And he, he doesn't get real good at it, and even the, the biographies point this out, but he, is, he, he models himself to the world as a, a king, a emperor, who is in the legacy of Rome and the legacy of the Christian Rome with Constantine, working closely with bishops to create something that is what sometimes it's called the Carolingian Renaissance. And in this Carolingian Renaissance, the uh, probably the thing that we know best from it, that we get directly from it, is Carolingian Minuscule, which is, is not just big letters all crunched together, but Carolingian Minuscule is actually where you develop capital letters and small letters and spaces and, it, and you can, it, it facilitates the, the structure of reading and education a lot better. Alkaline is key to that. So what we have is um, a very interesting and dynamic set of aspirations that are, they're not, perfectly tied together and interwoven, but we, they're recognizably Christian and they're recognizably um, Augustin, uh, um, Augustinian in the sense that uh, this sort of practical, you know, Christianity in which we root ourselves in the Bible, but it's a Bible that needs to be put into practice in the real world. And so therefore, you know, a statement like, and we read the Roland Bainton on Just War, is Jesus says, turn the other cheek. But what does that mean for a state? What does that mean for, you know, war? So, so things have to be interpreted, moderated, and, uh, and then in this interpretation and stuff, we're going to see a lot of this very interesting world of creation of sacraments and theology and literature and and literature will become heavily oriented towards signs and symbols of which you're going to read more about uh, next week. But then also you're reading in that Physiologos uh, material that uh, I've given you to read. So, so this, is the, this is the world of Gregory and Charlemagne. And, and it, you know, this is, uh, I would love to give you bigger history lectures about all that's going on, but... But if we can coordinate this time frame, 600 to 800, as the birth of a European identity, church and state, biblical, Christian, very dynamic, and then move into what we're going to see happening with St. Francis of Assisi and Bonaventure and the creation of universities, a sort of high Middle Ages and then an early Middle Ages here. Uh, by the way, uh, you know... Let's keep going here. There's this stuff here. I, I, this is what's going to happen later. See, those Vikings are going to come in and destabilize a lot of the stuff that, that these guys created. But they don't destabilize it completely. They actually revive it and change it, the, the Vikings. And then you have, here's your Lyle, the Viking. And then you uh, have a, a whole new bunch of things happening in, the, in a reinvigorated Renaissance after that.